Today we start chapter 9 of the Bhagavad Gita. So we are around almost halfway through 9 out of ninth chapter out of 18 chapters. The second half the chapters tend to be a little bit shorter. So we can safely say that we have covered a little over half of the Bhagavad Gita. The chapters this, that follow, especially chapter 9, may be partly a little bit esoteric, but these are all important chapters, so pay attention. If you don't follow or if you have issues, don't hesitate to ask. This chapter, chapter 9, is known as Rajvidya. Raja means king or royalty or the royal and Vidya is science or knowledge. So this chapter is about the royal science the king of sciences or the supreme science. This is the highest path. The blessed Lord said, To you who are free of all intolerance, I shall tell this secret most knowledge together with its realization, knowing which you will be freed from all that is impure. The royal science, the royal secret, this is the unexcelled purifier, the attainment of which is evident, meritorious, immutable and very easy to accomplish. The persons not having faith in this law, dharma, O scorcher of enemies, not finding me, keep returning on the path of death and the worldly cycles. These were verses 1, 2 and 3 of chapter 9. Shri Krishna is talking about the secret of secrets here, yeah. the secret most knowledge. Is there really any secret? We often hear about this rahasya, secret. People think that their teachers are not telling them the secret. There are those who think that Secrets are only meant for sannyasins, for those who give up and renounce the world, and that householders are not shared, that this secret is not shared with householders. Is this true? Is there such a secret? What do you think? What do you think, Balaji? Uh, I do not have any immediate answer to Swami because I was mm -hmm. uh, just contemplating on this point. Mm -hmm. Well, this is a common idea. I have encountered many people who think that there are some secrets that are being kept from them. So they want to know more. And when the teacher tells them something or gives them a practice, they want more practices, they want more techniques. So they think that they, their problems would be solved if they would know the secret. And that somehow a secret is being kept from them. There are no secrets. That is the amazing, but it is really true that no secrets are being kept from anybody. 
all the practices and techniques that you need to know in order to attain the highest state of consciousness and become a witness, to go beyond all suffering and misery is already available to you. There are no secrets. All the books have been printed. All the books that have been printed are also now available in the internet. There is nothing to, which has been kept concealed from anybody. It is true that much of these techniques as well as scriptures were earlier kept secret. And it is true that for a long, long time, for millennia, these secret practices were handed down from teacher to student. The teacher did not have to be a Swami or Sannyasi, neither did the student. In fact, the greatest sages of the Upanishads were all householders. And it was said that Swamis only taught other Swamis or Sannyasis only taught other Sannyasis and householders taught householders. So there were almost two lineages. One was the lineage of those who had renounced who had taken up Thyaga and those who were following the yogic path, they did not have to take up Thyaga. They were householders and they also had teachers who were householders. So that was how it used to be in the earlier times. When I say earlier times, I mean approximately... 200 to 300 years ago, before the British colonized India and made a complete change in the society. The society changed completely and so did many of these traditional practices and lineages. They changed. When the British came to India, they found all these texts and they were translated into English, they were published, and as you know, these texts and practices are all available in the internet today. So, there are no secrets. However, we still say, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam. That means, don't impart, don't impart, don't impart. And the reason for this is that you can do as many techniques as you want. You will not attain greater and deeper understanding if you are not able to train your mind effectively. If you don't have a mentor or a guide who has been through that process himself or herself before. You need a guide to that internal journey. It is very easy to learn techniques. It's very easy to get a mantra. But to go beyond suffering to go beyond the dualities, to truly attain something higher requires a burning desire, a willingness to change and transform, sharp buddhi and a good mentor or guide who has done it before. Therefore, a good teacher from an authentic tradition will always say, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam, Nadatavyam. They will not 
impart to those who are not prepared. If the student is not ready in the sense that he is still very attached to material things or his buddhi is not developed or his desire is not really strong enough, then such a teacher will not impart higher knowledge higher knowledge of how to go beyond the mind and establish oneself as a witness. One who is not ready because he does not have faith, because he is not practicing because he is lost in attachment and aversion will keep returning to the path of death will keep going through the cycles of birth death and rebirth So these were verses 1 to 3. Any questions or any thoughts about this? Uh, Radhika, uh, mm -hmm. just to answer your question, uh, mm -hmm. you always, uh, you, you have given me a few techniques and uh, I always felt that I am not doing it fully. So mm -hmm. I was always worried to come back and ask for more techniques. So. Mm -hmm. That's the answer, uh, maybe the response to whatever you said. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not quite following that. Was that a question or was that a... No, it's not a question. It's uh, just a response to what you just said. Uh, so mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the techniques and uh, why why not, uh, not to be imparted unless the student is prepared. Right. Uh, okay. But you felt you were not prepared. In spite of, you know, uh, you, you gave me only a few techniques which I was not able to fully uh, integrate in my life. Right. So I was always worried to come back and ask for more. So yes, I thought yes. maybe I should, whatever is given little bit, I should integrate in my life fully then, then before I come back and ask for additional technique or mm -hmm. uh, so, um, your further advice. So that, yes. that's the response. Yes, yes, that's good. That's good. You should remember, however, that... The teacher has the prerogative of deciding whether to give further or not. It's like imagining a child in a school. You know, the child may have some very high standards for himself and may feel he's not ready for something. But do you think that the child actually can decide that? Hmm? Imagine a 10-year-old child. Can the child really understand? Does the child have that overview to decide whether he should do something or not do something? Yes, it's, it's a prerogative of the teacher. Yes, you're right. Yes. The reason is that the teacher has the overview. As I mentioned just earlier, the teacher has been down this path before has an understanding of how the mind operates, has gone through all these pitfalls and dangers, has experienced what Ahankara can do, knows about the attitude of Manas and its unsteadiness, has seen the power of Chitta, knows how Buddhi can overcome all these. So with that kind of experience, it is the prerogative of the teacher to decide. Just as a child in school 
cannot decide whether he should uh, be promoted or whether he should repeat the class. No, the, 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 the student does not decide that. Right? And there is a good reason for that. So, the idea of don't impart is from a higher perspective of somebody who has certain experiences. There are students who are very modest and they hesitate to do more even though they are really able to do more. On the other hand, there are students who are very um, um, egotistical. I, I don't really want to use the word egotistical but there are students who do not have a good sense of their own level. They tend to overestimate themselves. And they keep, these are the ones who keep asking for more. And they don't allow things to integrate. Or of course they become impatient or they think something is being kept from me. I, I need that one secret practice that's going to solve my problems. And so, a lot depends on the attitude of the student, which is why, whether to impart or not, to assess the student and decide if the student is ready or not, is the prerogative of the teacher, the experienced teacher. We continue with verses 4 to 6. All this is pervaded by me, whose form is unmanifest. All beings are dwelling in me. I am not dwelling in them. Nor are the beings dwelling within me. See my yoga of sovereignty. Myself is the bearer of beings. Nurturing the beings, yet not dwelling in the beings. As a great wind dwelling in the sky reaches everywhere, so all the beings are dwelling within me. Be certain of this. This is what we have often heard, that the entire world is a manifestation which emerges from pure consciousness or the cosmic self. It is like a seed. It has a potential. And when circumstances are appropriate, when the conditions are appropriate, the seed sprouts. A gigantic tree emerges out of a very tiny seed. It may sound almost paradoxical. How is it possible for such a huge tree to be contained in a tiny little seed. That is the manifest and the unmanifest. The seed has the potential. That is life. Imagine yourself looking in the mirror. When you look in the mirror, what do you see? You see yourself. But are you living in the mirror? It appears very real and it appears like you are inside. But are you living in the mirror? No. 
But would it be appropriate to say that you are in the mirror, that one image in the mirror is you? Yes, that is you. But yet, it is not you. That is a reflection that which you see in the mirror. It's a reflection. What is the reflection of pure consciousness? Imagine pure consciousness would look in the mirror. What would you see? You would see the world. You would see all this, everything, the universe reflecting in the mirror. So this universe is like a reflection of pure consciousness. So does this universe, is it there? Is it, is it there? Yes, it's there. You see it in the mirror. Yet it's not there because it is merely a reflection. An illusion. And that seems to be paradoxical. And therefore, we very often don't understand this. All beings, therefore, are a part of pure consciousness, yet they are not part of pure consciousness. Because this is all an illusion. So these were some paradoxical verses. I hope that the two examples of the seed and the mirror made it a little bit easier to understand. Any thoughts or questions? Radhika, I could not understand the mirror example, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, you, when you look at your reflection, that's Balaji in the mirror, right? Yes. Yes. But is it really Balaji? That's something I'm trying to understand. <laughs> yeah, but that's just your reflection. That's not really you. Right? Okay. Yeah. But if your mirrors are very carefully placed, somebody could imagine, and he doesn't really see you, but he only sees your reflection, he might for a moment think, oh, that's Balaji. Right? But you okay. are standing somewhere else and you are not really seen clearly him and this person only sees your reflection and he, he, he's about to talk to you and then suddenly he realizes, oh, it's not Balaji, this is Balaji's reflection. You know, sometimes in uh, museums or in fun fairs, they have these house of mirrors, which are very confusing and you see mir mirrors everywhere and you're not sure where the person is, which one is the real person, because the reflections look so real and, and then you get confused. So that's exactly what the world is. We think it's real, but it's not. It's an illusion. Okay. Okay. And because we mistake this illusion for reality, we get into trouble. The entire cycle of death, birth, rebirth starts because 
we are mistaking this illusion of the world, the world illusion, we are mistaking it for reality. The reality is deeper and is behind. It's pure consciousness and it pervades everything. Like the seed, the potential is in the seed. It's hidden. And then it comes forward, it manifests as a tree. But the real essence of the tree was in the seed. It's okay if you don't understand everything. Yeah, it's, a, it's a process of integrating these ideas and letting them sink in. Contemplating on these. Yeah, it's, it's a ongoing process. Verses 7 to 10. All beings, O son of Kunti, come to my own primordial nature, Prakruti, at the end of a cycle, Kalpa, and again at the beginning of the next. I release them in various forms. Controlling my primordial nature, Prakruti, I emit again and again this entire aggregate of beings and elements, which is helpless because of the control of Prakriti. Nor do these acts bind me, O Arjun, as I remain neutral above them, unattached to these karmas. With me as supervisor, primordial nature brings forth the anim animate and inanimate worlds. Through this process, as the cause, O son of Kunti, the world keeps changing and revolving. These verses are talking about pralai. They're speaking of the macrocosm. The macrocosm or the universal self is similar to the individual self at a greater magnitude and the idea of time is cyclical. If you imagine nature, nature operates in cycles. There's day and there's night and then there's day again. It's a cycle. If you see the moon, there's also a cycle there, the lunar cycle. The moon is waxing, it becomes full moon, then it is waning, and then you have a dark night. Then again it starts waxing and you have a full moon. So that's the lunar cycle. Then you have a solar cycle, the seasons they keep following each other. There's, there's winter, there's spring, there's summer, there's autumn, and there's winter again. This may, depending on where you live, change a little bit. Maybe you have, you know, in some parts of the world it's just hot and hotter. And in some parts of the world it's just cold and colder. So depending on where you stay... But there is a general cycle, and nature follows that cycle. Similarly, there is a greater cycle which has been discovered lately by modern physics. They speak of a Big Bang. You may have heard of the Big Bang theory where the Big Bang takes place from, a, from the original cosmic egg and the entire universe emerges, keeps expanding. The universe is still, according to modern physics, in this phase where it is still expanding. A long, long time from now, 
the universe is going to start contracting. So say the physicists. And that the universe will contract back into a cosmic egg and eventually after a long, long time or no time, it will expand again. The sense of time disappears when there is no universe and there, is, there are no cycles. There is no sense of time. So, time is related to cycles. So here, these verses are speaking of the macrocosm and its cyclical approach to time. So the kalpa is such a cycle. And at the end of the cycle, everything goes back to that potential form, into the seed or the egg. And then they're released again. And the entire world illusion starts again. All the beings emerge. The play of consciousness unfolds until it is time to return back to that potential form of energy in the seed or egg, whichever example you like more. So everything comes through this process. All things, whether animate or inanimate, come through this process. The world changes, evolves, grows, and then returns back to its source. This is known as pralay. Okay. I don't know if there are going to be any questions about this. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, some of the verses here can be a little bit esoteric, a little bit um, difficult to follow. And of course you wonder, why do I need to know modern physics? As I mentioned earlier, you don't need to know modern physics. The Bhagavad Gita through intuition, through meditation, has a study of, has studied the world, nature, cosmology, and um, through intuition understood the different levels of consciousness, the different planes of existence, if you wish to call it that, and our spiritual development through these different worlds to attain ultimate liberation. Therefore, it's an overview or understanding. It's not uh, that you have to understand everything or that you have to study modern physics. Not at all. If there are no questions or thoughts about this, then I shall just continue. Only the foolish attribute to me a lesser station than I assume human bodies, not knowing my supreme aspect, which is the great lord of all beings, of vain expectations with vain actions, their knowledge in vain, devoid of wisdom, they have resorted to the enticing demonic and evil nature. Coming back 
to the example of the house of mirrors when I was speaking to Balaji. And I said, imagine you're in this house of mirrors where there are so many reflections that somebody would come and see you and would mistake in a reflection to be, to be the real person. And of course, if you're in a house of mirror, you realize, oh, th this is not a person, this is a, a reflection. So you know that the real person is somewhere else. And you find the real person because, you know, he's 3D and not in 2D, not flat. But the world illusion is so deep and so mysterious that we do not see that this is a reflection. Where is the real one? Who is the real one? Where is my true nature? Where is the true nature of all of this? So those who get caught up in this illusion, who are hypnotized and they don't see that the real one, the great Lord, is, is not in, in all these little things, but it's the whole thing, that it's pure consciousness. Those ones who get lost in this maya, they are devoid of wisdom. And this is the definition of a demonic and evil nature. We always think of evil as just bad. What is evil? It's just bad. But we don't have a clear concept of what it means. These verses explain that one who does not know the true self or cannot distinguish between true self and the manifestation is demonic. That is ignorance, that is avidya, and that is what is considered to be demonic or <clears throat> a lower plane of consciousness. Any thoughts on this? So one whose nature is tamasic who is deluded, whose mind is dull, is considered to be demonic or is an asura. We have mentioned these three planes before. Asuras are those of demonic nature, the human plane and the celestial plane. These are the three planes of consciousness, of, ex of existence that are in all traditions of the world. And they represent our development, our spiritual evolution. Okay, there seem to be no thoughts about this or no questions, so I'll continue. Verses 13 to 15. The great souled ones, however resorting to the divine nature, devote themselves to me with their minds or no other knowing me as the immutable origin of all beings and elements, always glorifying me 
and endeavouring with firmness of observances and vows, always bowing with devotion, ever joined in yoga, they worship me. Others, through the sacrificial observances in knowledge, in unity and multiplicity, worship me in various ways, who am tracing in all directions. The great souled ones are those of divine nature. In the last verses, we refer to those of demonic nature. Those who are tamasic or demonic are known as pashus. Those who have divine nature or sattvic in nature are known as divya. So depending on our nature, we act. Those who are pashus or demonic in nature, they are ignorant. They do not believe in pure consciousness. They do not believe in there being something greater behind this world. You may have met such people, you may have not thought of them as demonic, <laughs> but most of us meet people who say, no, there is nothing else. This is it. This is how the world is. And there's nothing like rebirth. When I die, that's it. It's over. They deny this essence, this pure consciousness, this divine nature. They deny it. They have very tamasic nature. They are known as pashus. But those who have a divine nature, they know that through deep contemplation, through reflection, that there is something which never changes. There's something that's permanent, eternal, unchanging. How do they know it? They may have contemplated a little bit. They may have observed from the time they were little children, perhaps, that people keep changing. First you were a baby, then you were a child, then you became a teenager, then you were an adult, then you became an old person, but something remained the same. As they grow through these different phases of life, they feel, feel in touch with that sameness inside of them. They observe the world around and they see all the time things are forming together and falling apart again. They observe cycles in nature. They observe things coming together and being destroyed. Families, for example, they come together, a couple comes together, has children, but then the children grow up, the family breaks, the children have their own families. That original family is gone. It's been broken up into many different families. And this continuous change, this flux, they observe that and they feel there is still something behind this change, behind this flux, and they are in touch with that sameness, that part which seems to be unchanging. And through practice, through devotion, they keep in touch with that part in themselves. They experience the unity within the multiplicity they experience the oneness in the manifold. Such is the nature of those who are divine or divya, having a sattvic nature. How do they worship? They worship 
by knowing the immutable part, the unchanging part. The next couple of verses are related to the same here, but they are far more poetic in nature. Verses 16 to 19. I am the sacrificial fire. I am the sacrifice. I am the offering given to the saintly ancestors. I am the herb of oblation. I am the mantra. I am the clarified butter. I am the fire. And I am the act of burning the offering. I am the father of this world, mother, sustainer, grandfather, the one to be known, the purifier, Om, Rig Veda, Sama Veda, as well as Yajur Veda. I am the goal, nourisher, master, witness, dwelling, refugee, refuge, friend, origin, disillusion, place, pledge, the imperishable seed. I scorch, I release the rain, and I hold it back. Also, I am the principle of immortality as well as death, existence as well as non-existence. O Arjuna. Verses 16 to 19, very poetic, very symbolic. They list basically different things, all sorts of things. Some are not related. Some are related. There's fire and there's rain. There's origin, there's a sustainer. There's grandfather and there's imperishable seed. There's clarified butter, which is ghee. And then there is om. So some of them don't seem to make any sort of sense together. They seem to be unrelated. And indeed, from a certain perspective, they are unrelated. And that is why they have been all put together. Because, he says, I am all of this. The Divine One, pure consciousness. I am all of this. I am also immortality and death. How can you be immortality as well as death? That seems paradoxical. How can you be existent as well as non-existent? It's paradoxical. It's because all dualities are encompassed by this whole, this divinity. All is consciousness. Aham Brahmasmi. That is what these verses are saying. Everything is consciousness. Nothing is excluded. Any thoughts about that? Ah, we are coming now to verses 20 to 22. These verses required a slightly more detailed explanation and I don't want to rush it because there are very interesting verses about the Soma Rasa, the Soma Rasa, or the juice, is um, also meant in a yogic sense. And 
as well as in a Vedic sense. They have different meanings. And since I don't want to rush into it, I would suggest we stop here today. I mentioned right at the beginning of the meeting, for those of you who are not here, that I wanted to stop five minutes earlier. And uh, this is a, an unfortunate place uh, to, to, to stop here right in, in between would be not very nice since uh, I don't want to rush through this. So let's continue with these verses from 20 onwards next Friday. And I wish you all a nice weekend. And see you next Friday. Bye, Radhika Ji. Bye, bye. 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 Bye, everyone. Bye, bye. Bye, bye. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye, bye. Bye, Nita. Bye, Debbie. Bye, Roseanne. Bye-bye, nice week. Yeah, bye-bye.